Conservatism in the banking world is super important, especially when people's checking and savings accounts are on the line. Recent examples of bank failures such as Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank show how fragile a bank can be if it doesn't manage its risk well and depositors start to pull their funds out. We're continuing our bank stock series here on Stock Stories to talk about one of the other major American banks, Wells Fargo. Today, we're going to cover the history, the business model, and the financials of this business. So let's talk about the stock that famous investor Charlie Munger purchased at the height of the 2008 financial crisis for just $5 per share. Welcome to Stock Stories. My name is Alex Mason, your stock storyteller, and welcome to the show. This is where we decode the business behind the stock. We're studying every component in the S&P 500 index. We studied over 145 businesses so far, and today we're gonna keep that trend going and talk about Wells Fargo. Let's first talk about the history of this business in order to get a holistic understanding of where Wells Fargo came from. Well, they were founded by two men named Henry Wells and William Fargo, and they lived in the 1800s in the United States of America. Henry Wells started his life apprenticing as a shoemaker and a tanner, but eventually he decided to travel around the country to help people with speech impediments because he had trouble speaking himself and he wanted to empower others. Now, he was hired in the 1841 by a man named William Hardin, and this man was interesting because he ran a company called Hardin & Company, one of the world's first express companies. Now, to put this into context, at the time, if you wanted something shipped across cities, you had very few options. I mean, planes certainly didn't exist, and cars were definitely nowhere near where they are today. So the U.S. Postal Service could help you, but it was a very slow service. And what wealthy clients did was they relied on private couriers to deliver their packages for them. But most people were not wealthy, and so they didn't have many options. Hardin's company filled a specific need by sending packages and mail by rail and even by ship across the Atlantic Ocean. Over time, Wells learned from Hardin and he set out on his own to create his own express business. And so he personally carried people's valuables, spending 18 out of every 21 days on the road. One time, he traveled to Buffalo, New York, and he delivered fresh oysters to some residents there. And they were so excited to see them, more excited than they were to even see railroads for the first time. Now, bankers and merchants started trusting Wells over time to deliver their payments, and he built up a reputation as a trustworthy courier. In 1845, Wells met Fargo and decided to hire him as a messenger. And he ended up getting on stagecoaches and traveled across the Midwest to deliver packages. Now, if you don't know what a stagecoach is, this is what people had before they had cars. It was literally a carriage with wheels drawn by horses, and that's what people used to get around and to travel. Now, eventually, Fargo hired messengers of his own. And once he learned the business, he eventually created the American Express Company in 1850. Now, around this time, there were rumors of gold in California all the way on the West Coast. Now, this news created a huge stir, and eventually, many Americans migrated from the more established cities in the Midwest and on the East Coast toward the West Coast. Wells and Fargo were on the board of American Express, and they proposed that the company extend their operations there, but the rest of the board didn't think that was a great idea, and they declined. As a result, Wells and Fargo decided to start their own operation together called Wells Fargo and & Company and placed their headquarters in San Francisco, California. They financed stagecoaches, which are now famous and still part of the company's logo, to travel far across the country in order to make deliveries. Now, by the time the gold rush ended, Wells Fargo had a major foothold in the West because, frankly, not many companies were willing to start out over there. In 1905, at the turn of the century, Wells Fargo and Company decided to split up its express operations and its banking operations. Now, the bank ended up merging with Nevada National Bank to become Wells Fargo Nevada National Bank. Now, the company was standalone focused on banking operations. In more recent decades, in the 1970s, the company invested heavily in data processing to keep up with the number of checks that were being written, as well as built up its commercial banking division in order to lend to tech startups in Silicon Valley. In the 90s, they were the first major bank to offer online banking in 1995. 
Fast forwarding to 2016, there was a scandal related to fraudulent cross-selling where employees created fake accounts for clients without their knowledge. This practice went back as far at least as 2013, but it took a couple of years for the issue to receive national attention. Now, the CEO ended up resigning. The bank has since attempted to rebrand and reestablish its image as trustworthy. This is probably the biggest scandal within the bank's history, and unfortunately, it happened relatively recently. But Wells Fargo still has many, many customers and is still trusted by many today. Let's go ahead and talk about Wells Fargo's The Business Today. How do we look at this business as investors? Well, they have four main divisions, consumer banking, commercial banking, corporate and investment banking, and then wealth and investment management. Let's describe a little bit about what those things mean. So consumer banking is probably the main touch point that the public has with Wells Fargo. It's lending money to consumers, giving people loans for cars, for houses, and also working with them to have checkings and savings accounts. Commercial banking is very similar, but instead of working with individuals, Wells Fargo is working with businesses. So lending businesses money to support their operations. Corporate and investment banking is more so about the relationship between businesses. So imagine a business wants to buy another business or have some kind of merger or acquisition. The corporate and investment banking division would charge a fee as, um, as an advisor on those kinds of transactions. And then the wealth and investment management arm, that's where people entrust their money to Wells Fargo to invest it for them. For example, investing it in the stock market with the help of an advisor hired by Wells Fargo. Let's turn our attention now to the finances of Wells Fargo's business. Now, the most recent fiscal year data at the time of this recording is for the year 2022, and overall revenue fell 6% in that year. Now, normally this would be a pretty bad sign in my book. I usually want to invest in businesses that are growing, right? But that only tells part of the story here. There are two main categories with Wells Fargo's revenue. There's net interest income and non-interest income. Interest income rose actually pretty nicely from $35 billion in 2021 to almost $45 billion in 2022. Rates were higher, which means that the bank was able to loan money out at higher interest rates and ultimately collect more money there. Now, non-interest income. What is non-interest income? This fell actually from $42 billion to $28 billion. But what does that mean? Well, non-interest income are things like the investment banking revenue or the fees that the business charges. That's where Wells Fargo really got hurt last year due to inflation and some lower economic activity. So overall, the picture of the revenue was a little bit lower for Wells Fargo. A specific example of this where the non-interest revenue fell was in the mortgage business. The mortgage revenue fell by almost $4 billion. And this was a major driver here for Wells Fargo. They didn't write a lot of home loans in 2022 compared to 2021, which makes a lot of sense because rates went up and people didn't want to buy houses as eagerly as they did before. Now, overall, the company still made a nice profit. Overall, they made $13 billion in 2022. This is still very good to me because they're actively shrinking certain parts of their business. And it's worth noting that they're still paying a lot of fines and penalties related to litigation. So they're still kind of coming up here. They're still trying to recover from this scandal several years ago. But fundamentally, it seems like a good business that's making money. They're simplifying their operations and they're positioning themselves for strong shareholder returns in the future. So what do we think about this business? Well, I think Wells Fargo is fundamentally good. They're facing some economic headwinds, but those economic headwinds are facing the majority of banks right now and generally the majority of the economy. Banks tend to swing back and forth with general economic activity because when there's more economic activity, more money flows through banks. Now, Wells Fargo is struggling with costs related to this litigation, but hey, that's temporary. Hopefully the culture is improving. Another thing I want to point out here is valuation. The stock price right now is only about 11 times earnings, which is actually relatively cheap, I think, or more so in line for what a bank should be or on the lower end of fairly valued. So Wells Fargo looks good to me here. They have a decent dividend, and I think that their free cash flow is bound to improve. 
So is Wells Fargo the number one bank in terms of balance sheet strength? Well, no, I think a bank like JP Morgan probably has a stronger balance sheet. But Wells Fargo seems like a pretty strong business in its own right. For that reason, I would consider Wells Fargo, if it were maybe at a little bit of cheaper valuation, I would personally want a little bit more of a discount here, given the relative strength of its peers. But overall, I think Wells Fargo seems like a good business and could be a good stock. All right, that's what I got for you today. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time on Stock Stories.